In today's lecture, we're going to discuss sexually transmitted infections, which are a group of diseases that are um, transmitted from one individual to another through sexual contact. And what we're going to discuss today, three different uh, topic areas, we're going to discuss some of the best prevention or reduction strategies to prevent or reduce the likelihood of uh, uh, transmittable infection. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the disease categories, what um, types of things cause sexually transmitted diseases, and then we're going to talk about some of the major STIs that infect the human population. So let's start out today with some of the best prevention or reduction practices that can be applied to sexually transmitted infections. Now, one of the best prevention strategies, let's start out prevention here, is to be well educated. And hopefully that's what we're achieving today with this lecture, is increasing your knowledge about sexually transmitted infections. Uh, in addition to being well educated, it's also important to practice abstinence. In fact, abstaining from sexual contact is really the only protective method, the only preventative method for reducing the likelihood of transmission of a sexually um, transmitted disease. After you're married, prevention can also be achieved through practice of monogamy with your uninfected spouse. Now it's also important to note that there are reduction strategies as well. So some ways that you can, to a reasonable level, reduce the effects of sexually transmitted diseases and infections. Um, one of the big things is to receive early diagnosis and treatment. A, section, sec, a second reduction strategy is to practice what would be deemed safer sex. And this is um, using contraceptives or other devices um, properly without, without error to help uh, reduce the, the contact and exchange of bodily fluids and other materials that can contain the pathogens that cause these diseases. So all of our sexually transmitted diseases, they are pathogenic. And what that means is it's actually diseases that are going to be caused by organisms. And we have several different classes of these pathogenic diseases based off of their organisms. This figure here shows you the rates uh, and prevalence of uh, different pathogenic diseases. And you can see that there's a estimated annual incidence. This would be the number of new cases every year. And that is 7.4 million uh, up here at the very top, 40,000 for HIV. And then over here, this is the estimated prevalence. This is the number of individuals within the population that um, are currently infected with certain types of uh, certain types of sexually transmitted infections. Now, these ones that say NA not applicable is because these are actually going to be um, diseases that can be treated to eliminate the um, 
not just the, the symptoms, but the disease entirely, but viral diseases such as human papillomavirus, genital herpes, these remain, um, these remain active within an individual uh, from the point of diagnosis um, for the rest of that individual's life. We never get rid of viral, um, viral infections. We can control the symptomology of those viral infections, but the virus is always there, and it can always be passed on to other individuals. So like I said, a pathogenic disease, um, all of these diseases are caused by microorganisms, and we categorize these different uh, infections based off of the organism that is causing the, the disease. So the first category are sexually transmitted diseases that are caused by bacterial infection. This is going to include things like chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. There's also a group of viral infections, hepatitis, herpes, HIV, and AIDS, genital warts, genital warts. There are fungal infections, tinea cruris, or uh, what can be referred to as jock itch, and yeast infections would be fungal diseases. There's also diseases that are caused by protozoa, it includes trichomonas, and then lastly, the fifth category of sexually transmitted diseases is parasites, which will include things like pubic lice. So let's take a look at individual STIs. We're going to deal with the major sexually transmitted infections. And this next image here shows the, the transmission risk for several different types of sexually transmitted infections. And the way that this uh, figure is organized is you have um, the, the number of or the rate of women who are infected by men versus in the lighter gray men infected by women. So an individual, um, if a female, let's say, um, engages in intercourse with a man or sexual um, contact with a man who's infected with chlamydia, they have a 40% risk of having that disease transmitted. So 40% of women who engage in sexual contact with men who have chlamydia will become infected themselves. 50% for gonorrhea, hepatitis B 10%, syphilis 30%. Uh, you can see that there are near equal incidences of women infecting men and men being infected by women for genital her herpes and genital warts. So there's some major transmission risks here for these different um, sexually transmitted infections. And we're going to start out with uh, uh, some of the bacterial infections. And we'll start out specifically with chlamydia. So the disease known as chlamydia, it's caused by a bacterium. And the specific bacterium is chlamydia trachomatis. Chlamydia is often asymptomatic. So quite frequently you don't even know that you have this bacterial infection, but it can lead to a series of different conditions including pelvic inflammatory disease, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, infertility, inflammation of the epididymis, inflammation of the urethra. The way that uh, the chlamydia is diagnosed is through 
through use of a urine test. And can be treated with antibiotics. Gonorrhea is another um, very prevalent bacterial infection. It's caused by the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhea. Again, this bacterial infection can lead towards pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, inflammation of the epididymis, of the urethra, can cause rashes, and even arthritis. Fortunately, this disease, this bacterial infection, can be transmitted to infants. So an individual can be born being exposed to this pathogen, and when they're born exposed to the pathogen, it causes serious eye infections. Oftentimes asymptomatic women. And men can lead towards urinary dysfunction and discomfort. Penile discharge. Gonorrhea is also diagnosed with the urine test. And is also treated with antibiotics. However, more and more strains, substrains of gonorrhea are building resistance to antibiotics. So many strains are becoming resistant to antibiotics and treatment can somewhat can sometimes be somewhat tricky. So I've mentioned uh, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. It's a outcome symptom of both chlamydia and gonorrhea. And it's a set of symptoms that in, in women can lead to infection of the reproductive tract. including the vaginal canal, the cervix, the uterus, the oviducts, and even into the uh, pelvic cavity. Uh, I said that chlamydia is often asymptomatic, and gonorrhea, especially in women, is also asymptomatic. And pelvic inflammatory disease will frequently follow untreated gonorrhea or chlamydia. And when it's not treated in PID forms, the results are infertility and an 
increased risk of ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy that forms outside of the uterine lining. So places like the, the uterine or the fallopian tubes, or even in the pelvic cavity. And then also pelvic inflammatory disease can cause chronic pelvic pain. Now, pelvic inflammatory disease can actually be treated with antibiotics by treating the gonorrhea and the chlamydia. But it may be severe enough to require hospitalization. Another type of sexually transmitted infection is going to be genital warts. And this is a viral infection. It's caused by the human papillomavirus. Or HPV. leads towards nodular growths that have a very warty appearance, uh, the genitals. It's estimated that right now in the United States about 20 million people Affected by the human papillomavirus, many of them with no symptoms, but still have the ability to transmit the infection of the virus. Now, it is a virus, and even though there are some antivirals, they're really not that effective. So for all intents and purposes, the treatment to eliminate human papilloma virus doesn't exist. So there is no treatment. One of the major concerns with human papilloma virus infection is it is a very high risk factor for cervical cancer. In fact, so much so that most cases of cervical cancer are considered actually to be as a result of human papilloma virus. Another Viral infection is the virus that causes genital herpes. This particular virus is affecting currently approximately 45 million adult Americans. This is another disease that infants can be exposed to during birth. Genital warts is going to be caused by two viruses. The first is HSV1, which is the virus that's usually associated with cold sores around the oral region. And the 
other is HSV2, which is usually associated with general ones. However, I'm sorry, not general warts, general herpes. However, the herpes simplex virus 1 can actually be transmitted to the genital region to form herpes simplex virus 2 to cause genital warts. The symptoms that are experienced with the genital herpes include recurrent outbreaks, painful genital lesions, or here too can also be asymptomatic. The disease is diagnosed based off of the symptomology or through a blood test. Once the virus is present, the virus is always present. It can be transmitted even in the absence of lesions. Another viral infection is uh, hepatitis B, or another disease caused by a virus, is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is damaging liver inflammation, so the virus will damage the liver cells and the liver tissue. damage can result to four different outcomes. Some individuals will just simply recover. Some individuals become chronic carriers of the virus and pass that on to subsequent sexual partners. Some individuals become infected with chronic liver disease. The fourth outcome, some individuals end up with liver cancer. The symptoms for hepatitis are going to include flu-like illness, that is frequently accompanied by jaundice. Jaundice is yellowing of the skin and other um, pigment, uh, I'm sorry, other tissues such as the eyes. Uh, and it's caused by an increase in bile pigments that normally are metabolized by the liver. But if we have dis dysfunction of the liver, we don't metabolize those, um, those pigments as effectively and they end up accumulating in the skin and the eye and other tissue locations. Hepatitis is diagnosed diagnosed with blood tests. And currently there is no cure. However, there is a vaccine. So you might be able to get the Hep B or the Hepatitis B vaccine which has greatly reduced the prevalence of hepatitis B in our population. Uh, another bacterial infection that we haven't hit on yet will be syphilis. Syphilis is actually caused by a 
uniquely shaped. It's a spiral shaped bacterium. That bacterium is Treponema pal pallidum. This particular bacteria is very, very nasty. Um, syphilis becomes a fatal disease without treatment. And exhibits a progressive symptomology. First signs of syphilis, the symptoms are called primary symptoms or primary syphilis. And include ulcers that are called canker. the disease progresses, it progresses to secondary syphilis. The symptomology of secondary syphilis is flu-like symptoms, aches and pains, and cold sweats and the like. The individual will also exhibit a skin rash. The third progressive state of syphilis is called late, or sometimes referred to as tertiary. It's late or tertiary syphilis. can lead towards either asymptomatic or symptomatic severe organ damage. This usually leads relatively quick on to death of the patient or the individual. Syphilis can also be diagnosed with blood tests. and can be effectively treated with doses of antibiotics. Another disease that if infants are exposed to the bacterium, they can also become infected. The last major sexually transmitted infection I want to discuss is AIDS and HIV. This figure here shows by country and continent and region of the world the prevalence of AIDS and HIV within the population. You can see Sub-Saharan Africa is by far followed by South and Southeast Asia, and these two areas comprise the majority, the vast majority of cases of AIDS and HIV on the planet right now. AIDS is the acquired immunodeficiency
syndrome. The acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is caused by HIV, that's a name of a virus. HIV stands for the human immunodeficiency virus. This virus, it's uh, responsible to damage the immune system. As it damages the immune system, that virus leads to the symptomology that's known as AIDS. Really, AIDS is a severe HIV infection. There is a pattern that occurs as this damage to the immune system progresses. First, we have a decrease in our white blood cell count. The white blood cells are responsible for much of our immune function. And as our immune function is reduced, as we eliminate our white blood cells, we end up with some initial acute illnesses. And then, by and large, we end up in the human population in the asymptomatic period that on average lasts about 11 years. So they start out with reduction of white blood cells. This leads towards this acute illness kind of in the initial phase, moving into an asymptomatic period that lasts roughly about 11 years. Now during that 11 year time period there's still physiological things that are occurring that eventually lead towards the symptomatic period. And as those symptoms begin to present, we're now at about 200 white blood cells per microliter down from 10,000. So very low levels of white blood cells. And now everyday infections become very opportunistic. It's these opportunistic infections, pneumonia or the flu, that lead to death. So those infections are no longer no longer able to be fought off by a diminished immune system, and so the individual succumbs to those diseases. Diagnosis is through a molecular assay. This molecular assay is used to detect the virus and the, the viral byproducts. What are the treatment strategies for AIDS? It's been shown that some antiviral drugs can be used to disrupt the viral reproduction. And the individual may be able to increase the time until symptoms develop. The individual is also given drugs to help with the response to those opportunistic infections. It becomes a very costly disease treatment and the thing that is probably the most disheartening is it's a 100% of 100% preventable disease
through abstinence and uninfected intercourse between one man and one woman.